<laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rochelle. Thank you, Sakaya, um, and to a Miss Mitt for setting up this panel for us. Um, this is the ins and outs of publishing, and we're going to do our best to get all of you as much information as possible about what can be a very confusing and um, uh, sometimes disheartening process, but we've got three folks here who have navigated it successfully, and they're going to give you all the tips and tricks that they know to help you on your journey. Um, so I'm going to start with some brief bios, um, and I'm going to start with Janica Bowman Lewis. She is an associate professor of English and director of the Center for the Study of the New South at the University of North Carolina. And she's the author of multiple books, including the Freedom Narratives of African American Women, published by McFarland in 2017. She's got a whole host of other roles that she plays, including being the founder of the Vanilla Bowman Foundation for Educational Impact, as well as uh, serving on the board of Freedom School Partners and Rise to Thrive Family Resource Center. Next up is Louvet Resto. She is a mother, teacher, poet, and Wonder Woman fanatic who was born in Aguas Buenas, Puerto Rico, but was raised in the Bronx. She is a Canto Mundo and Macondo Fellow and a Pushcart Prize nominee. She serves on the board of Women Who Submit. Um, her latest collection, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, is published by Flower Song Press. Um, and some of her latest work can be found in the anthology titled What Saves Us, Poems of Empathy and Outrage in the Age of Trump, edited by Martine Espada. Uh, and she currently lives in the San Gabriel Valley. And last but not least, Sharma Shields. She is the author of a short story collection, Favorite Monster, and two novels, The Sasquatch Hunter's Almanac and The Cassandra. She has short stories and essays that have appeared all over the place, as well as a host of awards, such as the um, 2016 Washington Book Award, the Autumn House Fiction Prize, the McGinnis, uh, Ta I'm sorry, Tim McGinnis Award for Humor, and the A.B. Guthrie Award for Outstanding Prose. She um, is, she runs a small press, Scadlin Books, and is a contributing editor for Moss, and she's currently employed, an employee of the Wishing Tree Books in Spokane, um, and she lives with her husband and their two children. That was very quick. That's because we've got a lot to get through and only a little bit of time to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have each of our panelists give you a very brief, like no more than two minute rundown of their path to publication for their most recent work to give you all a sense of where they're coming from and um, some of the experience they're bringing to this panel. So let's start with you, Janica. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you to everyone who coordinated and put time and energy into planning. Um, my path briefly, I'm a professor, which means a lot of my work is academic. But before that, I started out um, publishing children's picture books, which are actually the heart of my work as I think about educational impact. So I have um, three picture books. Uh, one is Brown All Over, which I wrote when my son discovered, like excitedly, that we were brown, like all over. And long story short, I had like gotten out of the shower and he was two and he was like, we're brown all over. I'm like, yes, we are. And so <laughs> I wrote that. And then uh, before Nia Marie passes the test to think about, um, especially young girls of color and how they're perceived in terms of test taking. And so I wanted to, you know, write a book about a girl who passes the test and, you know, what she does. But my current book is, um, Light and Legacies, Black Girlhood and Stories of Liberation. And it's an academic-ish book, but not really. It's really like my heart work of the last several years and has um, memoir, um, writing about Black women writers, and um, also some, some poetic work. And so I'll you know, talk later about um, the process of framing that within the context of research work, but I call it we search or, you know, at times me search because I'm, you know, trying to figure things out um, too. And so the path toward publishing that has been very different from um, my earlier work. Uh, my book, Freedom Narratives, was uh, research about how Black women, you know, thought about and defined freedom. And so all, I will say um, that all of my work is personal um, in many ways. And I know a lot of people on, on, uh, in this space too. And so um, caring for and tending to the personal nature of professional work has really been the journey um, for me right now. So glad to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'll turn it over to Lou Yvette. Hi, everyone. I apologize. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes? Awesome. Uh, so yeah, to keep it brief, uh, my latest collection, um, you know, I, I had been, it's my third collection, so I had been kind of working on it for quite some time, and I can get to that later regarding revisions and things like that, but it was, it's been about, uh, it was like about a good seven year, eight year project, and uh, to come to fruition, uh, but the project really started to come about, or had some possibility actually during the pandemic, just as we got started in 2020, like in March of 2020. And it happened completely by chance. And, 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 and it was, um, it was really, um, uh, again, just a conversation uh, that I had actually during an interview. And in the, at the end of the interview, I was asked like, oh, what's, what else do you have going on? And I said, well, I have this other thing going on, but it hasn't been published. And then, and then immediately the interviewer was like, let's have a conversation offline. I think I may have a publisher for you. And I was like, oh, well, well yeah, let's do that. But we had just started um, this pandemic. Again, I remember it being March of 2020. And so the path had been, and the book just came out in March of 2022. So it's been a long process and I had to be patient. So that's something else that I've learned over the last couple of years regarding this, this new collection. All right, let's turn it over to Sharma. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and Rochelle, thank you so much for um, moderating uh, today. And I am on uh, Spokane, traditional homelands here in Spokane, Washington. Um, so uh, my very first book uh, with this very hilarious cover of a teddy bear hugging a dinosaur uh, was published by Autumn House Press. It was uh, a short story manuscript award. The Autumn House Press is still uh, out there if people have short story collections and you're looking for um, a great press to send to. And I will say their design is better now than it was when they published my book. Um, no, I mean, I love the press. Uh, the designer uh, was not, um, we, we went back and forth about designs. This was the best one, but I still was trying to communicate that to me, a dinosaur was not a monster, um, but uh, a dinosaur it was that made the cover. So um, that was my very first experience um, with uh, the short story fiction award. Um, they, I, you don't get a huge advance. I got $1,500. They bought a ticket for me to go to Pittsburgh where the press is. And I got to have a, a beer with Stuart Onan, which was really exciting because he chose the book. Um, and that, that was it. Uh, I still get little royalty statements once a year because um, I, I have to make that $1,500 back and they'll send me a statement and it will say, you made $4.95, $4.95 toward your uh, $1,500 you owe us. Um, so that's kind of hilarious. But that really helped me um, find an agent, which I got for my next novel. Um, this one that came out with Henry Holt, um, it came out in paperback. Um, I got a way bigger advance uh, that I never, um, made back for them, uh, but I think the book did okay, uh, <laughs> but I didn't make the money back. And I think the advance, I'm always kind of forward about how much I make because I think it's interesting. Um, there's a huge range uh, and I'm also aware that at any moment I could be making, you know, I could be veering back to indie press publishing and making nothing, but for this book, I made uh, 30,000, I think. And they, I got a paycheck per year for that. Um, and then eventually I wrote another novel the Cassandra. This was my first hardcover. It sold again to Henry Holt, my same editor there. Um, and for this one, I made 50,000. Um, and the paperback mm. came out right as the pandemic was starting. And mm. uh, it has been remaindered already. So we'll see what happens uh, with, you know, my career next, because um, I, I feel like the important thing for me to, is to always be flexible. Um, and just really quickly, I want to add, um, I have also had a ton of fun doing little DIY, um, like um, zine projects uh, that will appear that are super fun. Um, these are, of course, things that don't get uh, uh, much press. I think we only printed about 50 of these, but um, just beautiful and co a collab with a bunch of local artists. Things like that are so cool. And I also run a press, uh, which I've sank a lot of money into, called Scablands Books, and we publish um, 
books as well. Um, Baby Speak Salish and Evergreen are our latest titles. Um, and I am not, uh, so I have a lot of experience with the self-publishing world too, is what I wanted to say, if anybody's curious about that. Um, anyway, uh, that's it. That's what I've got. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thank you. Um, so I did forget to mention, feel free to put chat, um, put questions in the chat as they come up. We'll come back to um, them at the very end. I had that same question, question Lisa, what does uh, remandered, remain, remandered mean? Um, but maybe if it's a quick answer, you can go ahead and uh, explain that real quick, Sharma. Uh, to be remaindered means that you have not sold enough copies of your book. Uh, so they are taking it uh, kind of, it's not gonna be in print any longer in its current form. So they are selling it at a remainder price. So it will be on the bargain tables of bookstores and it's uh, extremely inexpensive for bookstores um, to purchase it then. Got it. Okay. So like I was saying, feel free to put questions in the chat. Most of them we'll get to at the very end um, with the remaining 10 minutes or so. Okay. So we're going to start with some, we're going to try to get into like maybe some logistics, knowing that you could have a panel on just each of these things alone, but then we'll get to some sort of bigger picture questions at the end. But let's just start at the very beginning. You have a draft, you have a manuscript, you have a thing. What next? Now what? And anyone who wants to jump in, let me know. We'll we'll start with with them. Um, whoever wants to start. Oh, I can call on someone. Maybe Janica. Let's start with Janica. Sure, uh, because I am always, as I'm sure other people always have something in progress or in process. And so um, I'll say from the academic standpoint that having a deadline, like my first book, I had to write and get published for tenure. This one, I have to write and get published for um, promotion. And so that has helped give me a timeline. But having the idea and some of the work in writing has been the prompt um, to you know go and say, where does this go? And so I say that to say, usually I only have part of something before, but once you have the whole thing, it's like, who can care for my project in a particular, in a, a particular way? And you know, reaching out to networks for my latest book, the press actually came to me, which was nice, but um, thinking about, and it's uh, University of South Carolina Press, but thinking about um, having multiple options and not having um, to go with one place or, you know, being able to talk about your project with multiple people. So you have the draft or you, you know, have the manuscript, where do you want it to go? How do you, you know, make those connections if you don't have it already? And then, you know, writing the query letter or the proposal specifically to the press um, to share that project. So then becomes kind of the go point um, to, I have it now, you know, now what? And the now what for me was, where does it go and how do I get it there? And making those those calls and connections. I think it's a uh, for poetry. It's a it's a little different. I feel like uh, I like I said I had the, the third manuscript for easily about four years, five years, right? Like the revisions kept coming, and and um, I kept giving the manuscript to different people that I trusted for feedback. Because I knew some, you know, and I and I was very um, grateful for the feedback I got because everyone's feedback was fairly consistent, which was really good to see. Where people were saying, like, you know what, this poem doesn't really go with this manuscript. Like, it, there, there's a theme here. It doesn't. It's a beautiful poem, but it just doesn't belong here. And having to make those cuts or just move those poems over to maybe some other time, some other space. Um, yeah, I think when I with all the manuscripts I've had, I mean, it's about, I submitted my work to poetry prizes. So there is a monetary investment that has to happen there, right? It's like the fees are, I mean, it, I feel like the fees are going up every year. It's gone from $15 to 20, 25, 30, maybe even 35. And I understand you have, you know, to, to pay for the labor of someone reading the work. And so uh, investing in, in poetry prizes, I, I did that quite a bit. Um, and also, also just talking to my previous editor, like my first two books were published by Theo Chucha Press. So really talking to Luis Rodriguez and just asking him for advice of who I should send the third manuscript. And, and I listened to him and I submitted it to the places he, he uh, advised me to. 
Um, but also I agree with um, what you just mentioned is that it's about networking as well, right? Like talking to other people and saying, well, who published you? You think they'll be open to, to reading this manuscript? So networking does help out. But with poetry, I feel the poetry prizes when there's like a submission call going out with fees or no fees and 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 also doing research on the presses too. Like, do you see your work fitting into the mission of that press? Do you, you know, and would you be proud of that, right? Would you be proud to be then affiliated with that press, right? Uh, because you're gonna be forever affiliated with that press, whether you move on or not. So that's, that's to answer your question, Rachel, uh, Rachel is that like just kind of doing that kind of research is, was part of the process for me at least. Do you want to add anything, Sharma? Um, well, I just wanted to say I, I love both of those comments um, because it I've been thinking a lot about the change that happens when you've been really private with your work and then suddenly it, it turns into a collaboration. And I feel like that's when the work starts to really get better and sing um, is when you have that feedback happening um, with other people, whether it's your, I mean, for me, the first thing I do when I finish a project <clears throat> whether it's a short story or novel is, is have another person read it who I trust and get their feedback as has been, as has been discussed. Um, and eventually because I'm in the fiction world, I would send that to my editor. But um, before I had an agent, I mean, not my editor, my agent uh, reads everything first and then the editor eventually. Um, uh, but um, depending, I mean, depending on the project, I may not show my agent if it's something I'm, that's just a short story, for example. Um, that's something that I will think about and consider, you know, where I want to send that around to literary journals and the like. Um, and I think finding that home, um, as, as Lugo mentioned, is, is the right way to go. Um, and I think, did I just butcher your name? How do, how do you pronounce your name again? Sorry. It's all good. No, Lou Yvette. We bet. Okay, thank you. No worries. No worries. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, that's all I would add there. But um, but I love that movement that we always have from the private to the collaboration. So cool. Um, and Sharma, you spoke to this a little bit, but so then, what comes first, an agent or an editor? What are you pitching an editor? Are you going to find um, an agent? Like, what's the process there? Well, I feel like it depends again on the project. Um, I, I'm very curious about what the picture world book, or I'm sorry, <laughs> what, what the picture book world is like. And, and Janica can kind of speak to that a little bit. I work in a children's bookstore, so I just, I love um, picture books so much. Um, but uh, for short fiction, I would say usually, unless I feel like maybe I should try getting this in the New Yorker or something, um, usually I, I bypass my agent entirely and I'm looking for an editorial response. Um, I, mostly editors at big presses are not interested in short story collections even. Um, they're looking for novels that they can you know, really sell something. Uh, I mean, short story collections, I, I'm, I'm sure this is similar in, in poetry. Um, as well that uh, you know these things aren't frequently agented so it probably depends on the on the project but for me for a novel definitely my agent will I'll, I'll get editorial advice from my trusted friends and and family who who I know will read the work really well um, and then I'll get it to my agent so I try to get her a polished draft but then we with my novels we always have honed them together before we even give them to my agent at, at Holt. So. And if you're doing this for the first time, um, Janica Louisette, please feel free to jump in. And you don't have either an agent or an editor. Do you pitch to get an agent first or do you seek some editing um, advice? Or if you, I know for um, potentially for like academic worlds, you're not necessarily going through an agent route. So if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? can happen there with a couple different well a few different examples because for the children's book picture book I um, looked for you know presses first and you know wrote inquiries I never had an agent and then uh, you know didn't hear back and was like I know I have a story I'm gonna do it myself and so I initially went um, through Author House for one and through a local um, press in Charlotte uh, Hearthead Publishing for another which was the most probably caring process I have ever been through with, I mean, we met, she sat with me, 
we communicated. Um, and so then with the children's books, I republished them through another independent press, um, book buying press, and you know, had a you know fairly good experience. But then with my first research book, I did an independent press in North Carolina, which was also very caring and felt, you know, connecting. And so um, the you know advice we usually get is you know go through a university press and I and I think I had a better experience with the university press for this most recent book because of those processes before but it was a lot of kind of a trial and error like okay well I'm not hearing back but I know I have a story what can I do with it and then you know found the illustrator found this found that and so I think there are a bunch of different ways but also depending on what skills and networks you have versus what you know at least for me I needed other people to do. And so, um, you know, going to professionals in some way, you know, worked better. But, you know, a lot of times we have networks and skills that are, you know, closer to us that can, can help. Um, so figuring that out. I, with poetry, I don't have an agent. Like it's, it, it doesn't work that way. And I agree with Sharma, like, I mean, you know, poetry is usually like the last thing that agents want because they can't sell it as, you know, unfortunately. Um, even though it's equally as valuable as a novel, right? Um, I would argue. Um, so I don't, I don't have an agent. And so when I have a new work, it's about um, trusting a few choice people. Uh, I know exactly, I'm thinking right now regarding the last, uh, like I said, the, the, the latest one, I gave it to a friend of mine who is an editor, like he edits uh, in one of the university uh, magazines that he's in charge of, he's a professor. And I, I mean, he's also a poet as well, who I took classes with or workshops with. So, but I knew that he would be able to give me guidance. Um, and the publisher that I had when I gave him my work, his edits were, I mean, I, all of the presses were independent presses that I published with. So everybody has two, three other jobs. Let's just be real, right? So like my my publisher right now from Flower Song, Ed, Edward has a full-time job. You know, he's assistant, he manages uh, Buffalo Wild Wings in Texas. Like that's his bread and butter. And then he does Flower Song Press because he loves poetry and he wants to promote, you know, BIPOC writers and, and, and big ups to him for sure. But I get it. He can't give me the the attention probably that I needed or I wanted or I was asking for. So I was again, I wasn't upset about it. So I gave my manuscript to uh, people that I know who, who were in the positions of editors at the moment, either at the institutions or who've done editing, you know, and who were gracious enough to take a look at the work for about two or three months. That's another thing, too. You got to give people at least two or three months to look at your manuscript. I feel like that's the minimum because you want that care and you also do not want to rush that process. And you want to, I, again, I know they're doing it because they care about me and they care about my work and I'm not going to, and I'm just grateful because it is kind of, it is free labor for them. So um, I don't have an agent. So that's how I go about the editing through the editing process, basically. Okay. Um, and then on the topic of editing um, and that entire process, what is the, editing and revision process like for you all in your various um, specific uh, types of books that you're publishing? How did you, in that process, learn how to advocate for yourself and your voice? And also just generally, like how, how and when did you know to seek feedback from others? I can start because it feels very recent, at least with the, the last uh, project, which I just uh, turned in the the, I signed off on the formatted version to go through copy editing. But um, initially I felt like, oh, well, I'll be lucky if someone, you know, takes this project. And that was not the good way to feel about it because I, I didn't use my voice when I started writing and trying you know, to, to circulate for publication um, and came to, you know, with this last project to say, you know, this is my project. This is why I care about it. I need it to go through a process where it's being cared for rather than someone just saying like, if you do all these things, then you know it'll go forward. So I feel like I've learned to use my voice by knowing why I created it, um, knowing why I cared about it and not being afraid to say that. Whereas initially it was like, hopefully someone, one person will wanna read this. Um, but instead, you know, remembering why I, I did the work and saying that. And even in the editing revision process, so, um, you know, took all the time to write it, sent it in, got, you know, reader responses, had to respond to those and being able to say, 
um, even when um, readers ask questions, this is why I did that and not necessarily that I had to change everything that they wanna change. Um, and so that was big. And even from the editor, just being able to explain like, and you know, this is why I did that. And if it's not clear, then I could do other things. Um, but I think that's part of the advocacy too. Sometimes others can't see what, you know, we see in our heads, it, but sometimes it's just, I need to make it clearer rather than I need to change it or I need to remove it. And so that's definitely part of the advocacy. I agree, um, uh, Jenica. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right as well. Um, thank you. Um, when I got the feedback from peers, it's interesting. I will say this. Okay, so the double-edged sword about giving your, your work to friends is that they're your friends. I'm just going to say that, okay? So, <laughs> and I respect all my friends' ideas, but also it's like, what happens when they come back and say, hey, this isn't working, or hey, we need to cut this line, and you're like, ooh, okay, well, we disagree. <laughs> and then how do you approach that? And then how do you navigate that relationship, right? Because they, this whole thing is a friendship first and foremost. And so uh, I did get feedback from, uh, you know, through several iterations of the book, and a couple of times I didn't agree. Um, I was like, no, I, I want to keep that line or, you know what? No, I really, I think this poem does work in this collection and I can respectfully disagree. Um, and again, respect is the operative word, um, but I agree advocacy. Um, and if you, you know, I remember going back and forth with this, with a friend of mine going, cause he kept saying, I don't see how this particular line fits. And I said, well, it has to be there. And I agree with you, Janica, it was more about like, okay, how do I then make it work? Cause I really, really want it there. So I guess I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking out loud right now that also having friends take a look at your work, they're still your peers and you still have to have coffee and dinner with them afterwards. So, um, and, and share space with them. So how do you do that and do that well? Yeah, this is so great. I mean, I feel like I'm, I, I think as a, a, a listener of feedback, I tend to be more passive and I tend to be um, sometimes I think too passive. So um, I, I like uh, the term advocacy that um, Janaki used. That's that's something that I want to think about in, in my own work, too, um, because sometimes uh, I think I can be a little bit of a pushover. And there have been times when I've regretted that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think the key is understanding the story you want to tell. Um, you can, uh, I've really lucked out having an agent and an editor uh, professionally who really, I think, read my work really well and understand my work. And I, I would say that has been huge for me um, because I really respect the opinions of these women. And so I'm really happy that I've listened to them. Um, and I think they've only um, made my work better in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I think some of the pushback, uh, that I wish I had performed more was almost with like publicity departments, ways they wanted to market the book, things like that, um, that I that I wish I had done a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, something I'm kind of trying to figure out and um, kind of developing my self-esteem even now, even after having a career. I'm always, it's always interesting to me, like the new, the new ways you can feel rejected as your uh, career <laughs> continues. <laughs> so it's new and exciting ways of, rejection re receiving rejections uh never a dull moment but um yeah so uh anyway um and oh Jenica, go ahead i was just gonna say on the rejection and i really appreciate the last panel about grants and be back because i received so much rejection around grants and came to just say well either i need to shift the way i'm telling the story or like someone said you know i respectfully disagree with your declining <laughs> you know this but <laughs> i'm gonna do it anyway i'm gonna you know keep doing it so thank you for that um I guess on this, maybe on the same note of advocating for yourself, when you're, when you go the traditional publishing route, whether it's a big press, small press, press, whatever, and you get a document that you have to sign, um, how do you know sort of what's normal, what's not normal, what are you signing off, what do you push back on, did, were there resources that you went to to find this information, how did you know what you were signing, essentially? This is like pre-contract, like when you're sending things back. 
I had a conversation because when I first got, especially reader responses and Sakaya was, you know, witness to this, I was like, well, some people just want a different book and I can't write that book or I'm not writing that book. And so I had a conversation with the editor and he was like, you don't have to do all that stuff. <laughs> like, that's their opinion. And I was like, oh, so I can say no or no, thank you. It's like, you can just say, you know, here's what I'm doing here. And so um, sending back the final draft, so my, my draft now is at copy editing was really just logistics because at that point I had said, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm not doing. And it's like, if y'all are cool with that, we can move forward. But also being able to say, um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with, I'm not gonna make these changes, but being able to say why I'm not making it. And that's an option too. And they can then decide you know, how they feel about that, but. And when you're, maybe if we back up before you even get to that point yeah. and you've like, are, you know, meeting with a publishing house or whoever, a small press, and you're about to like, I don't want to say sell your book, but whatever that phrase is, what about in that moment? Like, what are you looking for? Are there any kind of red flags that you're aware of on, on a contract? Again, what resources did you look for when you were I'm always like afraid to sign on dot line, right? Like one of yeah. my friends. Make, sure, make so sure you have all the information. I'll say in an experience with in the past, um, I was signing an advanced contract, but the press was not going to send it out for feedback until I did like all of these things. And so I ended up then removing it from the advanced contract because I'm like, if it's going to sit for a year while you're like, oh, not yet, not yet. I didn't want to commit and not be able to, you know, circulate it. So that was a red flag for me and I'm sure others you know have that like when is it actually going to <laughs> leave your computer to go to someone so that's one I think I'm trying to remember uh the contract exper experience I mean I I was alone with looking at the contract the contract initially from the from the independent press that published my very first book um and I have also we have our own contracts because we have also published um, poetry uh, and Emma's book um, at Scablands Books. So, so I've even taken part in the writing of a contract. Um, and for me, with my experience being an author, when I wrote the contract, I wanted it to be as author driven for the author we're publishing as possible. I wanted them, like I even have written in the, because of my experience at Autumn House with the cover of my first book, um, I wanted, the author to have full feedback on what their book would look like so that they would be eager to go out there and sell the book to people. Um, because honestly, the author is going to be, no matter if you're with the traditional press, um, big five press or local independent press or self press, whatever it is, the author is going to be the number one publicist of their work. They are going to be the ones hitting uh, the pavement for that book uh, more than anyone else uh, usually. So, um, I even have it written into the contract that the author gets full feedback on what their cover looks like and we will not print the book until they're satisfied with that. All the, that sort of language that uh, is funny, I don't think is language that's ever been in any contracts that I myself have signed. Um, and I think in some ways, my sometimes my, my gratitude, this goes back to maybe me needing to beef up the old self-esteem bag or something, but I, um, I just picture it as like this little sad sack inside of me or something that needs some like steam pushed into it, but um, I, uh, I I think because I was so excited to be published, maybe I was overlooking things when I should have been more cautious, um, but fortunately my agent is a pro. She knew what to look for in contracts and she could talk to me about that with the novels. Um, I did not have that when I first signed with Autumn House and didn't realize um, kind of everything I was signing with that one. But I did have a friend who was a lawyer look at it just to make sure I wasn't, you know, giving away um, my firstborn child or something, uh, Rumpelstiltskin style. But I, um, yeah, so for me, uh, I, you know, I think it, there's always kind of a learning curve, but I feel like it's, again, that self-advocacy um, that, has been mentioned here that I think we need to, you know, think about as writers and to always be kind of looking out for ourselves in that way. Um, and taking that extra effort, even when we're so excited to get something out there and something published. Um, and that can be with the small, like the contract you signed for a literary journal for a short story or a poem, just as much as 
for uh, something, a, a bigger project. Um, really quickly, it, I just was able to, uh, like I was able to give the contract to somebody else to take a look at someone who I, my first, first contract ever with the Chat Press back in 2008, the, when I signed the contract, it was 2006. Um, and so I was, I mean, in my late twenties, it was my first book I had. And I mean, I trusted Luis Rodriguez absolutely, but I'm like, I don't know what I'm signing. You know, it was literally my first time doing something like this. So I remember uh, giving a copy of the contract to my graduate school professor. Uh, who had published already numerous books already at that point and was, had just been published by Norton actually. So I knew he, he knew his stuff. So I think for me, um, I had to, uh, again, just be, do a little bit of research on my own and then hand it off to someone who I trusted, who again, who had been through the trenches already just to look over to make sure that I wasn't signing off to anything. You know, again, I wasn't signing off my, my firstborn or anything like that, like Sharma said, and that everything was just kind of standard. So with this latest contract, I was able to look at my old contract and compare it and say, okay, these two look basically the same. I'm still retaining the rights of my work. Like that was really important to me. Like I'm still retaining the rights to my work, you know, uh, you know, regardless of what happens. And that was very key for me. So yes, um, networking, I go back to that, make, you know, use those professors and those and that, you know, not use them, but like actually reach out to them because they were your mentors for a reason. And you can still go, you know, reach out to them uh, a couple of years later and just email them and said, hey, this is happening. Can you take a look at this? I know you've been through this before. I, I don't want to be taken advantage of. And and so definitely uh, utilize those moments as well. Great. Um, I want to talk about self-publishing a little bit. Um, thoughts, experience, advice. And also I'm curious if any, I think someone in the chat even mentioned it, but Amazon self-publishing, if you guys have any, if, if you all have any um, experience or thoughts you want to share things to avoid things to look for i do have thoughts so i i went the the uh, vanity self uh, publishing route a couple of times and one big question is how much are you willing to pay for um for certain things and knowing like what you're paying for if you do that and so i wrote one uh, book that i published through a friend's press that I had not, well, I won't say friend, through someone I know who's press and, and I never saw anything from it. Like I saw that it got uploaded. I saw, but I, you know, I did my own events. I did my own everything. Um, going directly through Amazon, I know you can um, do that and you are responsible for the uploading for the, you know, creation. And if you're able to do that, yeah, the, the, the benefit is, um, you know, going online, people can access, but you are responsible for, you know, all of the marketing, all of the this, all of that. If you have that network and you have that will drop in time, because time is a big thing, I would say, you know, that's okay. But for um, me, it was important to have someone who at least kind of knew what they were doing, be able to do things for me. And then I could do different things, the, you know, future time. So when I went with the um, local press, I actually felt like that interaction and engagement was good for my project um, and not just about getting the book out there. But if you, again, have the skills and networks to do it all, uh, that's, that's an option. Sharma, I know you mentioned self-publishing earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I had seen someone, um, and I think I, I think Danica had some really great responses already. Um, I have a hard time doing both uh, the comments and back and forth. So I'm sorry. I, I, I'm glad you uh, asked this so I could answer. Uh, someone had asked about uh, how do you get your self-published work into bookstores? Um, and I, I actually work for a lo local independent bookstore, and I do the consignment there. So I uh, local writers will come in that are self-published and I am the one who decides like which of their books is going to go on the shelves. I think the key things, make sure it's really well edited, the text, uh, make sure if it's, if there are pictures, um, that the layout is great. I mean, make sure the layout is great regardless. Um, for me as a self-published uh, writer and as a, a producer of books with Scablands Books, for me, I knew I was not a great designer, so I have hired out. Um, it's all about the collaboration again for me. Um, I hire this amazing designer, Keely. Uh, I have a poetry editor because I, I love poetry, but I'm not a sharp editor with poetry. Um, so uh, my friend, Maya Jewel Zeller is a poetry editor. Uh, I am unpaid when I do this work, but I do, I do pay both of them for each project. 
Um, and uh, they make the books look beautiful, well edited. Well edited. Um, I help with copy editing, et cetera. Um, and uh, we use a local printer here. Uh, a great budget way to print is with Amazon. Uh, uh, is it called Kindle Direct? Is that what it's called? Or uh, something direct, direct publishing with Amazon? Because I think now they have it even set up that uh, you don't need the money in advance to, um, that you can, uh, you can pay them back uh, for the printing after you have some sales, which is huge because printing is so expensive. Um, this, this book that we have published, um, which is a Salish um, language manual by a local artist here in Spokane named Emma Noyes. She's absolutely wonderful. Her art is amazing. Um, she, um, um, this book initially was $5 for us to print per copy with the local press here. And they just told me that the price has gone up $2.50 per book because of supply chain issues. So you can imagine if we're printing 500 copies a time at a time of this book, um, it's really extraordinarily pricey. Um, so it's easy to get in trouble with finances there. But what I wanted to say, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Um, uh, use your local independent bookstores. They want to support local writers. Um, they're a great resource. Use Amazon, of course, because that's where a lot of your family members are going to order books. Uh, as an indie bookstore worker, I'd never order books from Amazon, but I also don't judge anybody for doing that because they have great prices at Amazon. They, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, I'm not about the judgment with that stuff, but um, it's there as a resource for you as a writer. And Amazon does, in its methods, support self published writers more than other traditional modes of publishing. So, um, anyways, things to consider there. Um, and hit up your local bookstores for that stuff for sure. Okay, we got one last question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, and one question I know that came up beforehand that I think spoke to everyone on this on this panel is about uh, maintaining your mental health, your overall wellness. As you can tell, there's a lot of different paths everyone's taken a lot of road bumps along the way. How do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep yourself sane? How do you keep yourself staying well? I think centering self as not just a writer, but as a human is important and something that it's easy to forget. When I wrote my first research book, I had a three-year-old child and a six-year-old. My three-year-old broke her arm and I'm like holding her up and like, I got to get this deadline. I got to get this. Deadline. And I'm like, you know what? No, this is what's going on. This is going to be my timeline. But just thinking about, you know, what I need to care for myself and especially the last couple of years, right? And there were days which, you know, community writing really helped. And I'm like, I'm not writing a day. I am grieving loss. I am doing this. I am taking a walk. I am and then coming to incorporate writing back as part of that, but not just thinking of, I am writing to create a product, but instead I am caring for myself as a human being and remembering that through the, the process and what does it take to care for myself as a person and those in my community while I am doing the work that is writing. And so for me, it's been a big recentering uh, of my who and why. I, um, yes, I agree with you completely. I you know I've had to just, I have three kids and, 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 and they're all bigger than that, but they're all teenagers and, they, you know, teenagers are needy. Uh, sometimes I feel like some needy, they're so needy. They're so needy. And there's a lot of regression that happens. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, so uh, for me, it's therapy. I, I am the advocate of therapy. I see my therapist every two weeks. Uh, sometimes I may need to see her um, a bit more than that. Or text her, say, "Hey, can we do an emergency phone session?" Um, but uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I remember uh, for this for this latest collection because I, for some reason, felt that like I needed to have this third book come out before I was forty. Like I was like, "This has to happen before this day." I don't know why. I was really stuck on this, and I have to admit that I've let go of having to keep up with all my other writer friends. There is this. And, for, and it's self-imposed. So it's not like anybody else is doing this. It's just self-imposed that I need to keep up with what everybody else is doing. And, you know, you go to social media and people are talking about their residencies and they're talking about their awards and they're talking about, look at this. And it's amazing and I'm happy and I'm proud. And this is not like a jealousy factor, but it's also a feeling of like, oh man, I'm not doing any of those things, right? 
I'm sitting here, you know, um, you know, binge watching the next show. And so I had to let go of that. I had to let go of keeping up with other people and just really recognizing my own pace and my own journey. And when I finished something, I would finish it. And that's basically it. I had to let go of this imposed uh, timeline and really leaning onto therapy and self-help books really was help. You know, for me, they, I read a lot of self-help books and they also um, have, um, have helped me through the last few years for sure. But I agree with you, Janica, it's about keeping yourself centered. Like you are first and foremost, you put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Oh, sorry. Um, that is great. I love these um, comments. I also, um, I'm glad to hear a little bit of a warning about teenagers. I'm about to have two of them. So get, bracing myself. Um, I've got a 12 and a 10 year old. Um, but I, um, I agree with the therapy. Um, for me, my big work right now is trying to, uh, again, that kind of that self esteem. Uh, that's a little bit lagging, which is interesting to me that that can happen even after, you know, awards won and, and books published and all of that. Um, and I, but I, I don't think it's abnormal, but, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to get up the strength to edit a book. I'm actually on the third draft of this novel and I'm still thinking about giving up on it. Uh, and I'm also okay if I do give up on it. I don't think that means I will never publish another book again. It means I will I will start a new project and eventually publish a book again. But I've also put a lot of um, pressure on myself in that way. And I'm, I'm realizing, um, especially after <laughs> these last couple of years, which have been difficult uh, because of a lot of what's been happening. Um, so I think, you know, for me, I, I always have to have to kind of take the mental health uh, into consideration. Um, because events can be very draining and, and having a public face with your book is very draining. Um, for me, what always ends up bringing me joy again is working on the uh, writing itself again. That's always the most joyful thing if I can get back to it. And even that has been hard for me to do that lately. Um, so I'm, I'm looking, I know that's my goal and what I want to return to. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, it's, it's kind of an ongoing process right now as I'm in my, I'm in my mid forties right now and trying to figure that stuff out still. So, um, you know, if you're struggling out there, you're not alone with any of it. Uh, so hugs to all of you. And hopefully organizations like Women Who Submit and the things that they offer are meant to help counteract some of that charm too, right? The feeling of being alone and, and struggling. Um, okay, I wanna get to some questions. I, I've been trying to keep up with the chat. I think some of the ones that have been posted there, our panelists have been really great about responding. If you still have questions and you posted it before and you still want me to um, read it out here, please feel free to post again. Um, but I did see, I guess, let me just start quickly with one on um, on sort of marketing, the question, I think a few of you already kind of answered, but of uh, getting your stuff into bookstores, um, getting or securing readings, just the general question of marketing, like that kind of stuff after you have the book and you need to get it out there. What sort of worked for you all um, in that process? What has worked for me has been like direct conversations with um, bookstores, not just in my own city, but um, wherever I go and I tend to travel. And even with the press for my current book, my marketing conversation with them was here are all the places that I would love for you all to contact and connect. And they don't always know. Sometimes they're just looking like, oh, you're in Charlotte, so we're going to look there. And so um, using networks there and you know, saying these are the festivals, these are the cities, these are the events that these different bookstores have. And then it makes it fun too, because you get to choose where you're going to talk about stuff. So. Oh, I forgot to mention, also feel free to raise your hand using the the uh, feature down below. Um, if you want to ask, I'll, again, I'll try to skip through the, the panelists to see if anyone has their hand raised also. I think for me really quickly, this this that I did differently this time around is because they're independent presses, there isn't a marketing team, unfortunately. Like it's usually the editor is the editor slash publisher <laughs> and they're the one-stop shop. Um, and again, um, I'm super grateful for, for both of the editors I've had over the past few years, absolutely. But um, because there is no there is no marketing team and you're do, you're the one really doing all of the work, you're the one hustling really to put it out there to 
to keep promoting it on social media when social media became a thing, going to your bookstore, things like that. This time around, what I decided to do for myself, which I know not everybody can do, is I actually hired a PR team. I actually hired, I, I sat with myself, I did a lot of self-reflection and I said, okay, I am worth it. Like I am financially worth this investment. And so it was not cheap. I did have to take out a personal loan in the, in, just to be fully transparent, like you were mentioning trauma, like I had to take out a personal loan, but I sat with that for a while to be like, can I really do this? Can I make the payments? And I said, yes, because I do believe. And I also, um, I had free consultation with a couple of PR firms, so again, free consultation just to get a vibe from them. And the one that I landed on, I really felt that their mission, who they were as a PR team was aligned with who I was an, as an artist. And so I went with them and I said, you know what, this is going to pay out. Like, I genuinely feel good about this and I'll make my money back eventually. And I feel good that my hands are in the, you know, my, my work is in the right hands and I'm still hustling and doing stuff on my own, but it is actually comforting to know that I have a PR team. Like I actually can email someone and say, Hey, these are like, like you just said, Janica, like, Hey, these are a couple of bookstores. Or can you reach out to them for me? Because I don't have the time and I'm paying you for that time. So that's something that I've done differently this time around. Um, again, the question is a little bit answered in the chat, but the question of where do you, if you are looking for a local indie press and you're trying to be intentional about what you're publishing or where you're publishing, um, and you're looking for one that specifically is either run by a BIPOC community, supports the BIPOC community, how do you find that? I responded that um, networks uh, are helpful with that too. Uh, and also, you know, books that you read that are uh, published by those presses, um, reaching out that way. Um, but sometimes it can be harder to find the smaller independent ones, but direct connections do help a lot. There's some great databases where you can do a lot of different term searches and everything um, on uh, new pages which I used a lot, um, or uh, poets and writers, especially if you're looking for indie presses. Um, but I remember uh, for a lot of those, I was, I, I would, um, I think one thing that was helpful to me was looking at what was around me locally. Um, and, and because not only that, you can get published with some of those publications that are local, but you also start meeting people, those editors, those writers who are publishing locally, and it creates more of kind of a, a community and a network. Um, and that's been really big for me. One of, one of the um, jobs I do, um, I mean, it's an unpaid, it's unpaid, but um, is with Moss uh, Literary Magazine, which is a Pacific Northwest journal. Um, and it's really exciting to see, you know, the new writers we're publishing there along with uh, more established writers. Um, but I, I, you can, in those search engines, put in uh, the region you're in, um, you can probably use the term BIPOC in there and you'll be impressed with all of the different resources it might give you. Um, I, I don't know if it will be wholly um, uh, representational of everything in your area, but I think doing that extra networking will help you find those locations. I would also, again, hit your indie bookstores. A lot of them subscribe to local journals. Uh, they do here in town. Um, in Spokane, they have some places that would definitely not be on new pages or poets and writers because they're too small, but they are at our local press um, or our local bookstore, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm being told we have to wrap up. It's four o'clock right now. Thank you so much, Sharma, Janica, and Louis-Vet. Um, Sakaya, I don't know if to turn it over to you or if we're- Yes, I have a couple of okay. things to, just, right. just to say. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank you, Sharma, Janica, and Louis-Vet for being great panelists and sharing all of this fantastic information with us um, today. Uh, I think it's going to be an ongoing journey for each of us to figure out which direction we want to go. And, uh, and y'all have set us in the right path. Um, please uh, help us with future planning. We 